County Cork, and in particular West Cork, would play a vital role in events that took place between 1913 and 1924. Young people had grown up hearing stories about the Great Famine, which had a devastating impact on that area of the country. With the eviction of tenant farmers, innocent people, including children dying of hunger, and a mass exodus of people, these stories helped instill in them a belief that only Irish people and not a foreign government should determine Ireland's future, and that could only be achieved by breaking the link between Ireland and Britain. Central to this movement was the Hales family of Knocknacara Ballinadi, a small townland outside Bandon, a staunchly loyalist town in West Cork. They grew up hearing stories of England's oppression from their father, Robert. They had grown up hearing the stories of the famine, of not just the immediate sort of um, impact of the famine as in people died, people were starving, but then what follows from that? People can't pay their rents, people are evicted from their homes. You've got the land war then that follows from that. And these are things that Robert Hale Sr would have witnessed himself, like he's a child at the time of the famine. And we know how, how things that happen in childhood leave a lasting impression on us throughout our lives. Um, he lived through the land war. Again, he would have been witness to the scenes that would have been taking place all around West Cork. And then he himself as a, a farmer, um, owning his little bit of land, um, it must have always been in their mind that this can be taken away from us. So what I've discovered through my research, that generation grow up hearing the stories from their fathers, from their mothers, um, of what life was like in the middle of the 1800s at the time of the famine, the emigration, the land war, the evictions, how the RIC sided with the landlords, took part in these events, um, also suppressed the Fenian rise in which Robert Wood, um, through his relationship with the Fenians, he is um, involved in the, the revolutionary movement. So all of this then filters down. He tells his children from a very young age about his activism, about what life was like. And it does filter through and it, it impacts them in such a way that when they get the chance, when they're old enough to make a difference, they fully immerse themselves in that movement. And it's true organisations, not just the revolutionary organisations in the Republican movement, the volunteers when it is set up, but you have them also being involved in um, the Gaelic League, sports, it's a big thing. All of these things that are sort of coming into being at the end of the 19th century, in the early 20th century, you find the Hales brothers and the Hales family and their neighbours. It's all of that generation that are becoming involved in those organisations that will then sort of create the future revolutionaries that will include the Hales family. were people of initiative. For instance, they kept uh, sire horses and they advertised these in the local papers. When I was over in um, the Imperial War Museum looking at um, Major Percival's, or General Percival as he was later, and looking at his uh, statements about um, the War of Independence in Ireland, one of the things I found in a file was a torn out piece of newspaper which had details about one of their sire horses that they were taking around to different places. He'd be standing, say, in a certain yard on um, in, in Tim League on one day and then Bandon another day and so on. So there were people of initiative. There were also people of initiative in that there were agricultural contractors. They had a steam engine and trashing machine and they trashed widely throughout the county which made them very well known and gave them many contacts later in, in the movement. And perhaps they may have gone even outside the county, I'm not sure. Some trashing outfits went down to Tipperary and places like that. So they would have a wide, uh, lots of people would know them. 
They were very good farmers. They um, won prizes at the Bandon Show, and again, people would see their names there who would be interested in such things. And they were uh, generally people, they were people of enterprise. They were sports people. In 1907, two cows of the Haleses were taken or distrained and brought into the pound in Bandon. And the Hales brothers arranged with their neighbours and friends to come in one day to Bandon and despite the presence of lots of uh, policemen or peelers as they were known as RIC men, they took the cattle out by force. It's a big operation and it shows from the early days that Tom and Sean, they, they're leaders, um, but also they have the respect of their friends, of their neighbours, because you find that some who take part in this operation will then become members of the, the local volunteer company. They will actually serve under Tom and Sean when the volunteers are set up. Um, so you have that loyalty from, uh, from an early stage. And basically, they go down to the pound, they find, find out where the, the cattle are being held. And there's this whole sort of setup where they distract the police. Sean then manages to get in and uh, basically get the cows, get them away. And um, the police are, there's a whole crowd that sort of sent in the way of the police to stop the police from actually stopping um, them taking the cows back. And they do successfully get the cows away. But now Sean himself then is arrested because they know who's involved in this. They know it's the Hales brothers all over this. Um, and Sean and a few of his friends are arrested. And they end up serving a prison sentence in Spike Island. Um, but that was the price they were willing to pay um, because they saw that this was wrong and they were the ones that could stop it, could change it, and they did. But it shows it's an early indication of the type of leadership skills of Sean and Tom and very importantly, the loyalty that Sean and Tom have from their friends, from their neighbours um, in the surrounding area of Ballinadee and for the beyond. Their main contribution, however, came from their involvement in the Irish Volunteers. Tom uh, was one of the first in, even though he was one of the younger brothers. Uh, age 23, he was involved in the establishment of the Irish Volunteers in Cork, City and County, in late 1913. Uh, and during the course of 1914 and on into 1915, he ensured that the Ballinadee Company, which came into formal existence in early 1915, uh, was... Uh, conducted themselves to a very high order. They attracted particular attention through their exemplary conduct during the Odell Van Rossa funeral in early August 1915. Um, and in the winter of 1915-1916, they were involved in preparations even without knowing it for the 1916 Rising. Easter week then, on the Wednesday, before Easter Sunday, Tom Hales was summoned by Thomas McCartan up to the, to the Volunteer Hall in Cork, which was their headquarters in Cork. Thomas McCartan told him that there was no... that he was forming a new battalion, and it would be the Balnady Battalion, and that Tom Hales would be the, the uh, officer commanding. And uh, as a result, um, and he also told him to prepare his company for the following Sunday, Easter Sunday, and that they were to have two days rations to, to take with them and that they were going on a long march. He didn't tell them. He didn't tell them. He told them they were going to towards Mutroom to kill Murray first and then towards Mutroom. And of course, uh, he didn't tell him any more. 
they were asked to come in to uh, feed it on the, the yard, and um, the Kerry volunteers were to bring the arms from Phoenix to Carrigonimma, and the Cork volunteers were to go to Carrigonimma to collect them. Now, there was a whole series of, of countermands in the last few days of, before Easter week from Owen McNeil mainly. Eventually on the, the Sunday, they were, they were not supposed to go to uh, uh, to carry an Emma. At Cool Car Bridge, there was a car pulled up, and uh, uh, Tom Osmer Curtin and and um, and uh, Terence McSweeney were in it, and they told them that they were not now to go to carry an Emma at all. They were to just go into McCroom and and return home. They, they reached McCroom at four o'clock on Easter Sunday evening. And it was one of the worst days rain of all time. It was teeming rain. And they had a kind of a council of war. They are the, the leaders. Uh, and they were told there they were not to go any further. They were to go return home. But Tom Hales, uh, Tom Hales stood up and uh, objected strongly to it there in the square in McCroom. Sadly, or I suppose, I, depending on your point of view, he had only one person to, uh, to support him, and that was a chap by the name of O'Gorman from Cork City. And the other five, uh, five opposed him, so they had to return home. Of the day's events, Tom later stated, we came back on the train as far as Crookstown with the Cork companies and stayed in the village until the early hours of Monday morning. It rained continuously until about 4 or 5 a.m. The companies then marched back to their areas. We were very disappointed. And during uh, Easter week, when the um, rising was going on in uh, Dublin, the Hales family were very strong in their opinion that Cork should be fighting as well. And even if Cork were that they themselves, their own company, should be fighting. And they wanted permission to attack local um, RIC stations and so on, which wasn't given to them. So they were, um, there was that, um, they, were, uh, they were held back, if you like, from what they would have liked to do at that stage. The Easter Rising, as we know, it was meant to be a nationwide event. As it happens, it's just centred in, in Dublin pretty much. But you had the, the Cork volunteers um, there overseeing this. But the way the week then goes on and, you know, it, it's not the nationwide rebellion and, you know, six days after the Easter Rising begins, it, it's over. And you have the, the, the roundups. Now you have... There, are, there is an instance um, in, in Cork with the Kent family where the police come looking um, to arrest Thomas Kent, but there's a shootout. And you have Thomas, he's arrested, he's later executed for uh, what happens there at his home. But there's a, an amnesty is agreed um, between the RIC and uh, through a, a local priest that anyone who is out, if they surrender their arms, they will be allowed to go home, nothing will happen. Now, Tom Hales is adamant that this does not happen. And you have turned to Sweeney at the Hales family home in Ballon the Day. And he's saying, no, you don't, don't give up the arms, don't surrender the arms. And also, you cannot trust the RIC, they will arrest us. And McSweeney takes the the what the word um of the priest, you know, the no, this this is not gonna happen, people are not gonna be arrested, just just give up the arms. But you couldn't blame the crowd in Cork. There were so many orders and countermanding orders. Uh, and anyway the crowd in Cork said that their their ammunition would last very, very very, very short length of time if there wasn't any kind of a a war like the crowd were in Dublin. And indeed, the uh, 
the balance of the meeting supported the, the Cork leaders, but the, um, the Hales got in their blow for what they believed in. And as uh, indeed later one of them said that, that they had been quite, they had been quite um, harsh on the, the, the Cork leaders, that's uh, Macartan and Max Sweeney. So Tom is totally against it. You don't surrender the arms. And Tom goes on the run. He won't stay at home. But you have McSweeney with um, William and Robert. There's a meeting taking place in the Hales family home. And of course the police then come looking for them. And they're all arrested. Now, Sean wasn't there at that time. Tom, as I said, is on the run. Um, but then this sort of, it, it, it solidifies the argument that Tom had that you cannot trust the Crown forces. He tell us one thing, but you know the opposite happens. So you find that there's a number of people that go on the run, including Tom Hales. But then Sean is arrested um, a few weeks later, and he's taken up to Richmond Barracks, where his brother Robert and Liam were also held. McSweeney was taken into custody up there, and then they're shipped out. They're transported, deported over to England. Um, Tom remains on the run, but then you have the general amnesty that happens in December 1916, where you have the majority of the volunteers that were arrested in the aftermath of 1916. They'd been held in Frongock and Termin Cap, so that's where uh, Robert and Liam and Sean were, alongside fellow Cork men that are going to emerge as the leaders in the next stage, which is Michael Collins and Groda Sullivan and so many others. 1,800 Irish prisoners were imprisoned in an old whiskey distillery at Frongok. The camp became a breeding ground for Irish rebellion, with inspired organisers such as Michael Collins coaching men in guerrilla tactics under the noses of the guards. Those interred there were to form the nucleus of what was to become the IRA. Later the camp became known as Altskull na Revloida, the University of Revolution. When they were in Frongok, in September of 1916, they held a sports, and um, Michael Collins, uh, the sports, uh, the, the, there was a um, volunteer from the whole country, you know, and M Michael Collins won three races, and um, Sean Hales won three of the uh, three of the of the of the of the weights events and uh, so that uh, you know between the two of them they more or less won half the half the trophies you know, and uh, so <laughs> the rest of the country probably won the other half like you know so in december just um, shortly before Christmas 1916 you have the deportees coming home but then those who are on the run are allowed to come home as well. Nothing's going to happen to them because public opinion has also began to change at that stage because of the British reaction to um, the Easter Rising. And it wasn't just the executions of the leaders. A big factor in that is those mass arrests that happened across the country because a lot of men were arrested that had no involvement, direct involvement to what was happening up in Dublin. Now, Tom does not forget what had happened. Um, he actually blames McSweeney um, and the Cork leadership for the surrender of the arms, but also then for the arrests. And when they begin to reorganise, he actually calls for McSweeney to be court-martialed um, because he sees that, you know, as a leader, they, they shouldn't have done this and they certainly shouldn't have given up the arms. Now, a court-martial doesn't happen, but Tom very much, very early on is, again, showing that he's not afraid to speak out. Um, and he sees that McSweeney was wrong to do what he did. And, you know, a junior officer in the Irish Volunteers, you know, it's, it's quite a thing to do to demand that your commanding officer be court-martialed for, for what Tom sees as an injustice. But they were able to, to, to heal their differences. Um, and then very soon after, we have the reorganisation of the volunteers nationwide. And what goes from being one brigade in Cork, um, because Cork is just such a massive area, it is then split into three. 
reorganization commenced in 1917 and 1918, with raids for arms becoming much more commonplace. With World War I still raging, Britain needed men to fight, and the Conscription Act by the House of Commons was vehemently opposed by clergy, Irish politicians, and the masses of Irish people. Upon the discovery of the so-called German plot, an alleged conspiracy between Irish volunteers and Germany to cause another rebellion in Ireland, mass arrests were made by Crown forces. The RIC, under the command of Sergeant Brennan, carried out an attempt to apprehend Sean Hales at the family home in Notnacurra. The family awoke to the sound of rifles hammering against the door. As their father opened up, the RIC men pushed him aside and called for Sean to give himself up. His response was they would never take him alive. Upon trying to handcuff him, their numbers were no match for Sean's hulk-like figure as he was well able for them. With the whole house now awake, his sister Madge called their younger brother Michael and told him to make his way towards where their brother Tom was staying. Upon hearing of the events at his home, Tom and three other men made their way to the scene. A constable waiting outside saw the men spread along the hillside and he could hear them shouting orders to each other. Madge had told the RIC men that a whole party of volunteers had them surrounded and that they should reconsider their actions. This made the RIC men nervous and Constables Kennelly and O'Sullivan laid down their arms. This created the perfect distraction for Sean to make his escape but Sergeant Brennan made one final attempt to capture him. A struggle ensued and Sean managed to grab Brennan's gun, pointing it directly at him. Sean's father urged him not to fire and instead escape. He did so, however, he would now become a highly wanted figure. The escape would also show the leadership ability of Tom Hales, as by spreading himself, William, Mick and Cornelius over a distance, they fooled the RIC into believing they were far more numerous than what they really were. When Tom was arrested in July 1920 with Pahart, so Tom being the Commandant of the West Cork Brigade, and um, Pahart was the Quartermaster, um, they're arrested at Lara's Farmhouse and they had documentation on them and they're arrested by the, the Crown Forces, the Essex Regiment, um, Auxiliaries and so on. Now Tom is a big name. It's a big capture for um, the Crown Forces, certainly for Major Percival, who was in control or in command of the Crown Forces down there. And it's well documented by Tom what happens um, when they're in custody because both Tom and Parhart are tortured. Um, one of those that's involved in the torture of them, the interrogation of them, is uh, a man called Captain Kelly. A man known well to history and infamy as uh, Captain Campbell Joseph O'Connor Kelly, or Captain Kelly for short. And he was the chief intelligence officer for the British in the south of Ireland, and he was the chief torture master as well. He had a gang of officers, if you wouldn't mind, under him, like Kyo and so on, or Co, some people pronounce it, uh, under him, who, who did the dirty work for him. And when he got hold of the boys here in Bandon, he was brought, he was brought from Cork to Bandon for this, to do a job on the on Hales and um, and uh, the poor Hales and and poor Pat Hart. And as Michael said, uh, not only did he uh, beat them to a pulp and so on um, umpteen times, but they used pliers on their fingers behind their back. Uh, twisting them, turning them, and so on, bringing blood to them, practically pulling off the nails off the, the fingers, and so forth. Uh, uh, the worst kind of torture that they could think of. And it is important to remember that this fellow, Kelly, was unfortunately an Irishman, God between us and all harm. 
but his people were always sort of lackeys to the aristocracy and probably considered they were better than the rest of us. But um, he, um, uh, to give an idea of uh, his progress, if that's the right word, afterwards, he was married in England. He um, abandoned his wife and kids and paid them nothing. He married another woman while he was still married. He didn't bother with any formality of divorce or anything. And even though he was caught because of his service in the army previously, I suppose, he got a slap on the wrist and was allowed nearly get away with it, except pay, had to pay something to his wife and family, his real first wife and family. And as well as that, in 1928, uh, Captain Kelly, the torture of Hales and uh, Pat Hart was drummed out of the British Army because he stole money from them, which would tell you the kind of man he was. As a result of the beating that they get, um, the two end up in hospital, both Tom Hales and, um, and Pat Hart end up in hospital before they're put on trial and they're, they're found guilty at a trial and sentenced to two years imprisonment and serve that prison sentence in England. But Michael Collins knows that something has happened um, and Tom, when he's in, um, in hospital, or between being in hospital and in custody, he actually writes um, uh, an account of what happened because we do have this whole um, propaganda war that was going on and the British were giving out a very different story as to what actually did happen. Um, so Tom wrote down exactly what happened to him and Pat Hart when they were interrogated and Collins gets that smuggled out and that is then printed and published for an international audience to read. Um, it was sent to America so the world can actually see what was going on. Now, what the British also foolishly did is they took photographs. Now, they denied that, um, that you know, pliers and canes and so on were used on Hart and Tom Hales. But there's actually a photograph where it's Tom and Pat Hart standing and they have the leather belt strapped around their neck and you can see them they're bloodied they have been beaten and Pahart is holding up a Union Jack flag now Tom talks about this in his account that they try to give him the flag that they're forced him to hold it up but he won't because he recognizes what it is and he refuses and then they give it to Pahart but it's like Pahart doesn't realize what he's holding Captain Kelly when um he knew that poor heart was so disturbed and so badly shaken up. And um, after his torture and so on, he actually went and visited him in, in jail or whatever in England, I presume just to taunt him and to see his own handiwork, if you'd call it like that. And um, it, it speaks volumes about that man, Captain Kelly because I believe that he was the lowest of the low you can get. They were being uh, sort of charged or they were looking for someone for the shooting of an RAC man in Cork um, called Morta. And Kelly just focuses that in on her saying, we're going to get you for it. We're going to get you for that murder. And it seems that is what then sends Hart over the edge. Um, and there's no, there's no bringing him back. And then what you see from Collins in relation to Hart is the efforts to try to get him help, to try to get him home so he can be looked after at home. Now, the prison doctors, like, they, they said, oh, Hart is faking it. Like, it's, it's a long time passes between Hart um, getting the actual help that he needs and he ends up in Broadmoor um, Asylum. So they, they keep him in the prison. They treat him as a common criminal. He's, he's not given any help, and this obviously impacts him further. And eventually, um, when the treaty was signed uh, between uh, Britain and Ireland, that ends you know, the, the, the War of Independence, and that gives Ireland, 26 counties, some form of freedom. 
one of the the terms of that was that anyone that was in custody would be released now there's there's two parts to this so those who are interned who are awaiting trial they're all released on the 8th of december um you know two days after the treaty was signed but those who had been sentenced those who the british don't want to give up it's february it's january 1922 when they're released so this is tom uh, Hales, this is Pahars that, that will be released. Now, Tom, in his time in prison, um, he was he was so active as in he is protesting at every opportunity because a big thing with the, the IRA, and we see it with Terence Sweeney and so on, is that they weren't regarded as political prisoners. The, the authorities refused to give them political status. Terence Sweeney had died on hunger strike as a result of uh, fighting for that right to be treated as a political prisoner. It's, they're not common criminals. The War of Independence began on the same day that the Doyle first met in 1919. Two RIC constables were shot dead by Irish volunteers under Dan Breen at Solohead Bag in Tipperary. What followed in Cork, such as the murder of Mayor Tomás McCurtain and engagements such as Kilmichael and Crossbarry, would be moments along with many others that would be forever remembered in the struggle for Irish freedom. Volunteers up to that point as the volunteers expanded and certainly once the three, three brigade structure of the volunteers in Cork comes into place in January 1919 and as Tom is made uh, officer commanding uh, of the 3rd West Cork Brigade. Sean is then appointed as officer commanding of the uh, Bandon Battalion, which of course was bigger than Ballinardy, and his brother William then takes over in Ballinardy. And they are then absolutely centrally involved in practically every major engagement that takes place uh, in West Cork over the course of the following two and a half years. Uh, the War of Independence really burst into life in, into life in 1920, uh, certainly from late 1920 onwards, uh, and, and even though not every single brother was involved in every single action, uh, the family was present at practically every engagement. It started off on a fairly small scale and then grew as time went on, and they got more support as time went on. And they, of course, they took part in many engagements against the British, attacking of, of RSC barracks, and then the, when, when Tom Barry came as a commander of the West, Talk, West Cork Flying Column, they were involved in that. Um, three, three of the Hales family were involved at the Battle of Cross Barry on the 19th of March, 1921. Sean Hales was section, section commander of number one section, and his brothers, uh, Bill and Bob, were also very much involved. Sean Hales was older than Tom. He was about, he was about, he was born in 1880. Sean Hales. He was about 10 years older than Tom Hales, but um, both of them were extremely important. Um, as I said, the Battle of Cross Valley, they played a very important role. Sean Hales, section of, in charge of section number one, and his brothers Bill and Bob were also very much involved in that battle, in which was a great victory over over, over the British. <clears throat> They were also involved in, 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 in many other engagements. For example, at Newsestown in October 1920, Sean Hales was in charge of a contingent of, of volunteers who um, took on the British there and succeeded in, in, in defeating them. The local IRA had no, no casualties. The British had a few casualties at Newsestown in 1920. Um, so, their story, they, 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 they were vital, they were a central part, an integral part of the whole volunteer movement from, from the early years of 1915 onwards and after 1916, right up, right up to um, 17, 18 and 19. I think uh, out of the family, most people know about Tom Hales, my grandfather, and Sean Hales, and the brothers William and Robert, especially in the context of Cross Barry Ambush. 
But Madge Hales is a fascinating character, as well as Donal Hales, uh, who was uh, based in Genoa, Italy, and acted as an envoy for the, the burgeoning Irish government. So Madge basically was the HQ, Administration Central Intelligence <laughs> Office of Nakhnakura. And while she was supporting Tom and Sean and all of them in terms of their endeavours in Ireland, she was the contact with uh, Donal in, in Italy. There's, there's more sort of resting on Madge because not only is she involved in the revolutionary movement, but she's also keeping things going at home. Because her brothers, because they're on the radar of the Crown forces and they're after them, they're on the run. So Madge has to keep things going at home, like helping to run the family farm, um, looking after her mother, looking after her father, but also while she's, you know, trying to organise gun running uh, for through Michael Collins with her brother Donal, who is the Republican consul in Genoa. So Madge was interacting with Donal all the time. Donal was based in Gen Genoa in Italy and the IRA were using Donal or they were utilizing him in terms of his contacts with various groups in Italy to source guns and ammunition. Uh, their resources are very low and they're running out of ammunition and guns. Um, so Madge actually went over there for a period of time, I think up to five or six months, um, to meet various contacts. Initially, they contacted the Italian government, but they didn't want to get involved with it in terms of uh, the politics of it. But they were referred on to other parties. And at this time, this is where a young fella called Mussolini comes into the picture. And um, it was at the, after the end of World War I, and there was a lot of ornaments still floating around in the country. And uh, they were doing a deal to access these and get them sent to Ireland. There's a letter from Madge to Collins uh, pleading with him to, to get the money over there. I think it was something like £10,000 in old money. And uh, almost as if she's reprimanding him in one way to, you know, where's the money? We need to get the, the, the consignment over. Madge, like so many women, um, had been. It is said she was a member of Coming Amon, um, but a lot of women were actually told to leave Coming Amon that there should be no paper trail, there should be no obvious connection to that movement. Now, Madge would be on the radar of the authorities because of who her brothers were and because they were so well known. But you don't give them, you don't sort of hand that information to them on a plate. She was basically the agent, you know, the administration agent behind the scenes. Um, she was able to go by train to Dublin, you know, to meet various parties, including Collins, convey messages. She was able to go to Italy. So yeah, she was a kind of astute and she kept behind the scenes, but I think a very essential cog in the whole operation. In reality, it never actually, was never realised and not on for anything that Madge did or anything that Donald did. Um, it, it just never transpired. That arms shipment that was meant to, that was arranged by Madge um, through Donald, it never arrived in Ireland. He's a volunteer. John Murphy was born in uh, Kilmac Simon Key, which was a village near Clahan, Belnady, and uh, Kilbritton. This was a stronghold of Irish republicanism in West Cork, and there were about 90 men involved in the IRB at the time. On um, the 26th of June, 1921, John Murphy was returning from Bandon, where he had been visiting his girlfriend. He was um, going to attend to livestock at the Hales' farm. And at the time, the Hales brothers were on the run, and uh, five days previous, on the 21st of June, Sean Hales had orchestrated the burning of Castle Bernard near Bandon. On that faithful Sunday, John was intercepted by uh, the Essex Regiment. Um, these were a terror force introduced by the British government in order to um, usurp the newly risen Irish people. There were about 400 of uh, the Essex 
um, in West Cork and they were under the command of the infamous Lieutenant General Arthur Percival. So in the farmyard, uh, John uh, was captured by the Essex and he called out to Mrs. Hales, uh, the matriarch of the uh, Hales family. Um, he called, he shouted Mammy, which was a familiar term with him. And um, of course, the, the British then assumed that he was a um, one of the Hales brothers, so they beat him and they tied both his arms and his hands to the back of the lorry. Um, they then proceeded to drag him along a dirt road um, from Naknakura to Kilmac Simon, which was just over a mile. Um, there was a local woman, um, Ellen O'Brien. She stated that um, she heard his death cries in the distance. Con Flynn arranged the funeral um, that night and John was buried at midnight with full military honours adjacent to the chapel in Balnadee. In 1966 a monument was erected to commemorate John in his honour and it was again organised by Con Flynn and with contributions from the Hales family. Castle Bernard came at more or less at the end of the War of Independence. At this stage, there was a number of um, volunteer as prisoners facing execution by the British, and they had executed people. So the strategy was that they would capture very important people like Lord Bandon and others and hold them uh, basically as hostages for um, the uh, safety of the um, volunteers. And in fact, the strategy worked. But when the um, um, uh, Sean, uh, Sean Hales led a smallish group to go and capture Lord Brandon, he went to um, capture Lord Brandon with a small group and uh, didn't find him when they went into the house. And then he said that as the bird has flown, we will destroy the nest. And they decided to burn the house. Meanwhile, they came across Lord Bandon and they captured it. Now, of course, this was all after the burning of Hales's own house by the British, by the Essex Regiment. And uh, some people say, whether it is true or not, that when um, Lord Brandon was looking at his house, he is supposed to have said, my beautiful house is burned down. And apparently Sean Hales said to him, if true, so is mine, my lord. But there was an equality about that, all right. But he was taken and kept in places like Clagoc and South of Tim League in places of safety. He was well treated and uh, eventually he was left go. The, 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 there weren't any more executions, so the strategy had worked. Tom Barry had been appointed Chief Liaison Officer for the Martial Law Area, which included Cork. In this role, he was to liaise with British officers to ensure that both sides were adhering to the terms of the truce. He was aware of the attitudes from Crown forces towards him and his fellow Irishmen and felt that they had to be vigilant. He believed that the men had to remain alert and above all, they must remain a disciplined fighting unit. But as he later stated, the truce went on for six long months and I feel it was deliberately calculated by the British to drag it out as long as they could. They were used to dealing with subject races, and they knew very well that a long truce is always bad for the weaker force. They knew that our morale and effectiveness were bound to deteriorate over a long period. All the British forces in Ireland, they were all housed in barracks, 
and they were paid, dressed and fed. But what was our guerrilla force going to do in that long six months? No one was paying them. They couldn't afford to stay around training and maintaining a state of readiness. I would estimate that by the time the treaty was signed, there was at least 30% deterioration in our effectiveness, our structure and our morale. And this was a carefully calculated policy by the British. On the 11th of October 1921, talks between the Irish and English governments began in London with the aim of negotiating a treaty between the two countries. The Irish delegation consisted of Arthur Griffith, Michael Collins, Robert Barton, Eamon Duggan and George Gavin Duffy. Heated exchanges were frequent between both sides and discussions went on for almost two months and certain Irish people held prayer vigils for a peaceful resolution. During this time, Collins managed to make contact with Tom Hales, who was being held in an English prison. Despite being under surveillance, Collins garnered some success speaking to Tom in their native language, Oscoilge, conveying the difficulties they were encountering in getting a republic from the British. Sadly, the reality was that they were never going to get a full republic, as many other countries under British rule were watching closely, such as India and Palestine. The empire had to be protected at all costs. Finally, in the early hours of December 6th, 1921, under threat of immediate war, the Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed by the Irish and British delegates. As we know, it did not give full freedom to Ireland. Instead, Ireland would become a free state, a dominion within the British Empire with some control over her own affairs. What became most unpalatable was that Irish members of Parliament would have to swear an oath of allegiance to the British monarch. Collins believed that it was a stepping stone to full freedom. However, what was to follow in Ireland would see brother against brother as the country became divided, with many a debate between anti-treaty and pro-treaty factions in the Dáil. Sean Hales was elected in 1921, and speaking on the treaty he said, Posterity will judge us all, and I still look upon the treaty as the best rock from which to jump off for the final accomplishment of the Irish freedom. Tension grew, however, and division insidiously crept its way in as Eamon de Valera resigned and left with his now anti-treaty colleagues. Despite attempts at unity in June of 1922, both sides developed rival narratives to support their position. Those in the IRA who opposed the Free State Government had mutinied against their civilian authorities and were mutineers or irregulars. They were therefore upholding democracy as the Irish people had voted in the June election of that year. Sadly, the anti-treaty IRA attempted to wage a guerrilla campaign against the Free State, like that which they had mounted against the British. This would become just as bloody as the War of Independence and would create immense heartbreak to Mother Ireland, as her people would now be at odds that would see blood on the hands of a country that was once united, but now divided. It's quite surprising, I suppose, if you look at the Hales family and what they had endured from 1916 right through 1918, the War of Independence, that the family would split on the issue of the treaty. Now, Tom was in prison, um, so he's not on the ground, but Sean was still free. Liam and Robert are there and, and, and Madge is there. But they're such a Republican family that it is very surprising that Sean and Madge accept the treaty while Tom, Robert and Liam and Donald reject it. You'd think they would be united and all of them would reject the treaty. But, you know, they both, I suppose both factions, they were Republican um, in their ideals but just believed that there were different ways on how to achieve that republic. And Sean gives a very clear um, reason or explanation as to why he accepted the treaty. Um, and it was in the, uh, the private session of the Dáil, uh, the, the sessions that were holding while the, the, the debates were going on. 
And I suppose it sums up what a lot of men who went pro treat or people who took the pro treat side, what their reasoning was for it. And that he basically says, and I'm paraphrasing here, that Britain had proven over the centuries that she could not be trusted. In that treaties had been signed time and time and time again, and the British had signed them and accepted them in good faith, and Britain always stabbed them in the back. Well, now it was their turn. That they would basically be good little boys and girls for a couple of years, and as soon as it was the right time, they would pay England back. They would do exactly what the British had done to the Irish people centuries before. So the Republic is still the goal, um, but just it's a different way. Just wait by their time. And then you can see, you can understand totally from Tom's perspective, uh, Robert's perspective, Liam's perspective, you know, certainly Tom Hales did not go through all of that suffering, the torture, everything for what he perceived to be a sellout, um, a betrayal of the Republic. In terms of the, the, the damage caused by the Civil War, I, I think the, the thing that was most damaging was that the, the natural pride that would otherwise have been taken in the exploits that family members had undertaken and the bravery they had shown during the War of Independence, to a certain extent, there's a, a shadow or a pall is cast over uh, the, the pride that would otherwise have been taken. It was very difficult for any family that had been affected by the uh, by the treaty split to come out wholeheartedly, for example, once the uh, ceasefire comes in place in 1923, or even though Tom uh, becomes a member of Fianna Fáil, even after Fianna Fáil's victory in 1932, because the, the commemoration of the, civil, of the War of Independence was always going to be affected, if not completely overshadowed, but certainly affected by the memory of what came after. And, and what came after in the context of the, the Hales family was so appalling, uh, and their contribution to the War of Independence had been so great that the contrast, I think, between the two w was, was more significant for their family than for most. Despite the many attempts by journalists and others to sort of draw out either Tom or Sean to attack each other in public and um, because they were on opposing sides they they never they never did so their differences were were kept within you know the the private sphere um but this split this this division had huge consequences because it's not just the family that is affected you know and the family for their own reasons. Each of them had their own reasons for rejecting or accepting the treaty. Like Madge doesn't accept the treaty just because Sean does. You know, Madge herself had been politically active, had been involved in this movement, just like Robert Lean and Tom and Donald. So they all make their decisions, you know, based on their 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 own for their own reasons. But their their family is split. The family is 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 devastated by this, and um, what impact did that have on the parents to watch literally um, their children be on opposite sides? But then it has the wider impact because the Hales family were sort of like the the they were the glue holding that that Republican movement together for want of a better word in Balnadie, like they were had been. Like Todd being first officer of the Ballina D Company, Sean is there as an officer, Robert and Liam are there, their neighbours are the ones that are the volunteers in Ballina D, and then that expands beyond Bandon or to Bandon as the movement grows, as Sean and Tom rise up through the ranks, um, they have that loyalty being built up within them. So it must have been a huge turmoil for their friends, for their comrades, because who do they go with? And we do have those decisions being made in the Civil War. How men, how people actually chose what side they were on in the Civil War. In some cases it was, well, what side did their commanding officer take? Which, what was their stance? Were they pro-treaty or anti-treaty? And sometimes that was the, the way men made their decisions. So how can you make a decision when one of your commanding officers goes on one side and the other commanding officer 
takes the opposite side. And the case of the Ballon and Deacon, that decision could not be made. And they choose to take no part. They choose to take, to not take a side because they're going to be fighting one way or the other against their, their former leaders, their friends, their neighbours. So although it's a split within, between two brothers, that expands. That, that split has a ripple effect within a family, within a community, the immediate community, and it expands to include the, a, a bigger community and maybe even impacts West Cork. You know, it's, it's those divisions that start between two people have a massive impact um, in the greater scheme of things. The division over the treaty within the Hales family, to a large extent, mirrors the divisions within the country as a whole. And many of the arguments that were put forward by the leading figures on both the pro and anti treaty side, people like Michael Collins and, and uh, Eamon de Valera, uh, are, are echoed in the opinions expressed by the family members. Sean was very firmly in the stepping stone camp. Uh, he viewed the treaty as the extent to which it involved any sacrifice. Uh, it involved not a sacrifice of principle, but was merely a temporary expedient that would soon be overcome. He argued that such was the extent of war weariness within West Cork in particular, which of course had borne the brunt of so much. Um, and more generally, that there really wasn't an alternative. There wasn't the appetite for a renewed fight in the depths of, of winter uh, of 1921, uh, even within, within sections of the IRA and perhaps more importantly, within the uh, broader Irish public. Tom and the other brothers uh, took a different view. Uh, their view was that the, the sacrifices that had been made, and their family, of course, had been very closely involved in those sacrifices. Tom, of course, had been tortured. One of his close compatriots was essentially driven mad, insane by that same torture. They had seen their, their family home burnt down. They'd seen so many other family homes burnt, burnt down. They had seen their friends uh, shot dead in the field. They'd seen others executed. Uh, and he argued that all those sacrifices had been in the sport of the one cause. Uh, the cause of the Republic. He, of course, was a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, um, as, of course, was Collins, but he, he found himself, perhaps, in a, perhaps surprisingly, in a minority within the IRB in, in insisting that that Republican status was non-negotiable. So there was... A, a, but the most important thing to remember is that these are principled differences. They are... The, the arguments that were put forward by the two brothers and, as it were, on behalf of the two sides of the argument. But I said there was merit in both. Uh, it is, I think, wrong, certainly at this distance, uh, to come to an adjudication of where the balance of, of truth lay, uh, other than to note that both absolutely sincerely believed in the rightness of their point of view, but both were also understanding of the other's argument. Tom understood the argument put forward with regard to war awareness. Sean understood the argument that Tom had put forward with regard to possible sacrifice of principle. What they both sought to do, even once the, the treaty split, the political split had taken place, they were both at one in desperately trying to avoid uh, any military split. They were involved in, in trying to prevent a split within the court volunteers and were broadly successful for all the differences of opinion until the outbreak of the war. Once the war breaks out, of course, then and once the shooting match starts, then it's very, very difficult to hold any centre of ground. Uh, but even while the war was ongoing, uh, the two brothers spoke fondly of each other. Collins had been doing the, the tour of West Cork, so meeting with, you know, a lot of his supporters and, you know, he's, he, there's photographs all around West Cork of Collins leaving hotels, skivering and so on. And you can imagine it must have been a, 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 a jam-packed day. They must have been exhausted because they would have set out um, in the early hours. But on the return back to Cork City, they stop in Bandon. And Bandon is where Sean Hales was actually based. That's where his headquarters were. Um, and word is sent to Sean that Collins has arrived, so they meet down in what's now the, the Munster Arms Hotel. 
And Sean knows that the West Cork, Cork, there's a lot of anti-treaty activity. Roads are being blocked. Um, you know, it's it's a war and it is a war zone. It is a, an area of intense activity. And it was dangerous. And he warns Collins, he tells him, do not go that way. There are other ways, there are other routes that you can take. Like this was Sean's playground, this is Sean's area. Um, Collins had been up and done for so long, so maybe he's not, you know, as close to the ground as people like Sean would be. It is their stomping ground. And Collins doesn't listen. So he sets off, despite Sean's warnings, he sets off on the route that he wants to go, little known that he's driving right into an ambush beam that had been planned or overseen by Tom Hales, the brother of the man who told him, do not go that way. Yes, well, Bill Be Leblanc was a very significant um, event during the Civil War. Um, Michael Collins came to West Cork, to his native county, with some of his supporters, Emmett Dalton and some others, and they went on a tour of, 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 of West Cork. Now, some people say that um, that uh, Tom, that that uh, Michael Collins came to West Cork on that occasion to um, negotiate with the anti-treaty forces, anti-treaty side, to bring about uh, some kind of resolution. But. That doesn't seem to be the case. Liam Deasy, who was also involved in in at the, in Bail and Blow, has stated. Liam Deasy has stated that Michael Collins did not come to West Cork on that occasion to negotiate with the anti-treaty side. That wasn't his purpose. That was more as a social visit. He wanted to come to West Cork. He was he was the head of the, of, of of the army, and he wanted to come to West Cork to to meet his friends and his family and all that type of thing. And he came to Crookstown and he was spotted by a man called Dennis Long travelling in the in the car. They they asked for directions towards Bandon and Dennis Long gave them directions. And Long noticed that he recognised Collins on, on, on board. And then Tom Hales got word of this. Tom of course being anti treaty against the treaty, Sean for the treaty. So Tom Hales got word of this and he organised an ambush to take place. They were waiting all day and nothing was happening. And then they thought some of the, some of the ambushing party had left. They had left the scene. But five or six of them were left behind, including Tom Hales and Tom Kelleher and Jim Hurley and Dan Holland and so on. They were left behind. And all of a sudden, in the evening, in, in the afternoon, when everybody thought nothing was going to happen, they saw the motorcyclist coming at the head of the convoy, the Collins convoy. They had put a car, uh, they had put him, a mine had been placed on the road, a man called O'Callaghan was involved in that and, 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 and a, horse and a horse cart was put across the road. And Tom Hales was down at the road. Tom Kelleher and Jim Hurley were kind of up on the hillside a bit. And when they, they, they knew that the, the, this convoy would be right on them within, within seconds. And Kelleher shouted Jim Hurley to, to fire a shot to, to, alert, to alert Tom Hales that there was a convoy coming. And Hurley did that. And Tom Hales got away with others. He got away from the, the, the situation. No, he could have quite easily, if he hadn't been alerted, he could have been there quite easily caught there uh, without realizing who was coming. So then Kelleher and um, Holly got back on up, up, up onto the height, and then after the fighting started fairly, fairly soon. And unfortunately, Collins moved away a bit from his car, the armor car, to the center of the road, and he was shot. Now there's so many theories, there are several theories as to what happened there. But my opinion is that nobody can say with certainty who shot Michael Collins. There are an awful lot of theories about it. There's one theory uh, that could have some influence. 
And that is the one that somebody was putting. There, there were changes in the convoy. The convoy was changed in Cork. Why was it changed? There is one theory that it, the British didn't want Collins to to live because he was he he was he was part of the of the uh, Free State administration, but he was also negotiating with the people north of the border, providing them with help to fight the British. So the British were aware of that. And that is, that is quite a possibility that that could have happened, that he could have been. The other big question about Collins killing is that there was no inquiry put, taken into it. There was no inquiry. There was no, first of all, no, no examination of his body, of his remains, which is rather strange because that always happened. Then there was no inquiry. And Sean Hales, for example, Sean Hales was very, very upset. They were all upset, even the anti-treaty people, like Tom Keller, Tom Hales and so on. They, they weren't happy either with the, with the killing of Collins. Um, Sean Hales made many attempts to try and have an inquiry. And each time that he tried, he went to Dublin specially, Sean Hales went to Dublin specially to talk to W.T. Cosgrave and other members of the administration there in the Splide and Company to make sure to, to, to try and to try and, and and impress upon them the need for the need for an inquiry into Colin's killing. Sean wanted to know what actually happened at Bell that night. Um, you know, Tom was overseeing the, the ambush party. And there were things that obviously didn't sit well with Sean. There was no inquest, a proper inquest held into the death of Collins. Now, you have obviously an awful worry on Sean because three of his brothers, um, Tom, Robert and Liam, were all on the anti-treaty side. By November 1922, the three of them were in custody. Now, it must have been a, a, an awful shock for Sean when he discovers that, that Tom was arrested. Because if you can imagine, by that stage, after the death of Collins, like the, the Civil War starts to really enter into a, a, a savage phase. You have the, the reprisal killings and so on. So that obviously played on Sean's mind to, to, get, shot, to, get, to get Tom to, to safety, um, to get him out of the, the, the way of people who might want revenge for the death of Collins. And it's like once Tom is safely away in custody, he's not under any harm, it's like Sean then shifts his focus to trying to find out, well, what actually happened at Bay on the Blah. Because he did meet Sean after the ambush and there, there were obviously points raised that made Sean question the official version and um, what was given as to what happened um, uh, that, at, at Bay on the Blah. But the thing is, you have resistance um, in Dublin um, to any sort of inquiries being made um, by Sean into wanting a, a proper inquest um, to be held. Now, the doll wasn't sitting at that time. Um, it's only in December, around the 6th of December, that the doll actually meets. Um, but Sean sort of appeals, they're, they're, you know, he's, he's met with, with, with closed doors. Um, however, you do have um, Porrick O'Malley and he becomes the last count coral of the doll. So he would have been in a position to maybe raise in the doll um, the possibility of a proper investigation um, being undertaken to discover what actually did happen at Bell and Blow. <laughs> As you would expect, allowing for the fact that they were very upset, obviously, at their leader uh, being shot down and so on, allowing for that, and allowing for the fact that I'm coming from the opposite side politically, I just don't understand the Free State decision not to hold such an inquest. I'm sure Sean Hales, or Sean Hales didn't either. Uh, I, I can't understand it. Uh, in fact, uh, I can't understand that. But um, it strikes me as being suspicious. Somebody, I feel, in power didn't want something to come out. Whatever it is, I don't know. And I wouldn't speculate beyond that because, to be honest, pure speculation.
So Sean is in the Ormond Hotel. And what happened was that himself and O'Malia were going to the doll um, on the 7th of December, 1922. And the two of them come out of the Ormond Hotel. Now, thanks to the release of the pension files from military archives, information surrounding these events, more new information is being released. And there is um, an account in one pension file that states that the anti-treaty IRA, um, there was a waitress in the Ormond Hotel, working in the Ormond Hotel, who was anti-treaty, who was sympathetic to the anti-treaty IRA. Um, and she passed on information to the local entry IRA that O'Malley was there and Sean Hales was there. Now the thing is, O'Malley was uh, was on the, the the was a target or was going to be targeted by the entry IRA, and the reason for that was because at this stage. You had emergency legislation introduced by the Free State Government, by the Provisional Government, that basically states that anyone who was found with a gun or explosives, um, they would be executed or they could be executed. Now, this is known as the murder bill by the anti-treaty IRA. And this was voted on in the Dáil. Now, anyone who voted for that, um, they were then legitimate targets. Um, in the eyes of the anti treaty IRA, and O'Malley is one of those people. Sean Hales was not involved in that vote, despite the fact that he was a TD. He's, he doesn't vote on it. So, O'Malley is in the sights of the anti treaty IRA, and apparently, through this waitress, word is then sent to the local anti treaty IRA that O'Malley is, is in the vicinity. So, they send some men down. Some men are sent to the Ormond Hotel. And O'Malley and Hales come out of the Ormond Hotel. There's a Jarvey waiting for them outside. Um, O'Malley gets on. However, a person he knows calls him back. And he steps back to talk to this person. And Sean Hales moves over in his position. And at that very moment, you have the Ant Street IRA coming around the corner. It seems pretty much open and fire as they go. And Sean takes the full force. He's, he's hit. Um, now, O'Malley was wounded, but Sean takes the brunt of it. And the, how you do have it, there's a, a, a British soldier in, in an armoured car or in a lorry nearby, and he like makes chase, and he goes after the, 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 the IRA, um, but he loses them. And in those seconds after, literally, Jervis Street Hospital was two blocks away from the Ormond Hotel. So the Jarvie is told, go, get down to, to um, Jervis Street Hospital. And despite the fact that it was probably less than two minutes away by the time to get to Jervis Street Hospital, Sean Hales was dead. When Tom Kelleher spoke about the, the people that took part in the, in the um, War of Independence, he never distinguished between those who were for the treaty and those against the treaty. He always said, for example, Sean Hills is an example. Sean Hills, as I said earlier, was a section commander across Barry, a colleague of Tom Keller, another section commander across Barry. But in, in speaking of Sean Hills, Tom Keller never said, ah, he was the one that was pro-treaty. He never said that. He always treated Sean Hills as being you know, he was my colleague from, from, from the War of Independence. He was the, my colleague at the Battle Across Barry and other engagements at New Sistown and other engagements. He was my colleague. Never said he was different from the other. He was always treated the same as the other second commanders like John Lord and Dennis Lord and John uh, Pete Carney, Christy O'Connell, uh, Mike Crowley and, 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 and the others. He, was always, he always treated them like that. He would have been very upset by the, by the, by the killing of, 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 um, of Sean Hills. The night before Turin ambush, that was the 21st of, of October 1920, uh, the headquarters for the battalion that time was in Dandily in his uh, house in Balmorphy. Is no, no one by the Keller family, but um, uh, Tom Barry gives a good description of the preparations that night. 
and how Charlie Hurley was there down on the floor of the kitchen and he was trying to um, ensure that the mine might work. As, as you probably know, uh, the volunteers were very unsuccessful with mines. and uh, uh, But um, he mentions that the two people talking at the wall were Sean Hales and Dick Barrett, and he said very, very good friends. The consequences of this are huge, um, not only for the Hales family, because if you look at it, um, Madge now, who supports the treaty, like her brother Sean, she now has a brother that is dead. She has three brothers that are in prison. Um, you don't know what's going to happen to them because of what is going to follow the ne very next day shows that anything can happen here. Um, her mother and father, they're pretty much destitute because their home was destroyed. So Madge is, is watching all of this, literally watching the world collapse around her. But what happens the very next day, four anti-treaty IRA men were executed in Mountjoy Jail. Um, now, there is a newspaper interview, or uh, uh, there's an interview in one of the newspapers from W.T. Cosgrave, who was the, the president of the, the provisional government, or the Free State. And he says in the aftermath of the, the shooting of Sean Hales, like there's, there's so much newspaper coverage to the shooting of Sean and then the aftermath. And what W.T. Cosgrave says is that the night before Sean Hales was, was killed, um, he and the Minister for Defence, Richard Mulcahy, were actually talking about giving clemency, offering clemency to the anti treat IRA. You know, look, too much has happened, you know. Collins is dead, Griffith is dead, Brewer is dead, all of these people are dead, and it, we're, we're going down a path that we cannot come back from. However, with the death of Sean Hales, with the killing of Sean Hales, not only a, an officer in the National Army, but a TD, because TDs were being targeted by the anti treat IRA, W.T. Cosgrave says, that's it, we're going to smash them. And in the very next day, the four Republicans, anti treaty Ray men that were executed, had nothing whatsoever to do with the shooting of Sean Hales or the targeting of, Am of Amalia or the order to shoot TDs who had voted for that, um, that murder bill. The four men were in prison, were in custody, from the 30th of June because they'd been arrested after the four courts had been taken. So at the very start of the Civil War, these four men, Rory O'Connor, Liam Mellows, Joe McKelvey and Dick Barrett, um, were taken out of cells in Mountjoy Jail. One, it is said, to represent each of the four provinces. So Joe McKelvey, Ulster, Rory O'Connor, Leinster, Liam Mellows, Connacht and Dick Barrett, um, Munster. But the ultimate tragedy of this is these four men who were executed by firing squad had nothing whatsoever to do with the death of Sean Hale. Dick Barrett and Sean Hales were really good friends. Dick Barrett's from Balneen, Sean from Bandon, Nakura. And the family were absolutely um, in uproar about this. And of all of the killings for Sean Hales, uh, they felt it was um, an injustice or um, it was the wrong decision by the Free State Government at the time. Um, and they wrote to that, uh, to various media, especially um, newspapers in Cork, saying that they totally disagree with this move and I suppose gave their um, compassion, you know, and support to the Barrett family in Balneen. There is little or no evidence uh, that the death of Sean Hales was anything other than an act of war by a Dublin volunteer who uh, became aware that Sean Hales was in his locality uh, and followed through on an order issued by uh, Liam Lynch, a general order uh, to kill those who were most associated uh, in the eyes of Republicans, particularly with uh, the, the treaty decision, and particularly those who'd voted in favour of the treaty. There are other hypotheses that other theories, um, as indeed there always will be uh, in, in a killing such of this nature. But it was, it was a killing that was carried out uh, by a soldier on one side of a civil war split, killing a soldier 
on another side of the civil wars. But it, the real tragedy is not, I suppose, therefore the killing of Sean Hales per se, but the fact that a situation had developed, a civil war had developed, where soldiers who both considered themselves Republican uh, found themselves on, on different sides of the divide, and one killed the other. Sean was one of the oldest of the family, and if you like, the leader of the family, if you like, you know? Um, but despite that, a cop, uh, they wrote to the Cork Examiner, De deploring the reprisal shooting of the four Republicans in, in, in very strong terms. And it was, it was to their credit that they did that. The father, the mother, well, the, Tom was in prison, so his name wasn't on it. Um, but. Um, Madge's so, name was on it. Yeah. Um, and it included Madge's name, who was on the, the uh, Free State side, which was particularly. Important. As we approach the centenary of the outbreak and awful events of the Civil War, uh, there's a natural tendency for, I suppose, each of us who are interested to, to look back and to think, well, which side would I have taken or how would I have reacted to uh, this development or, or that event? Uh, and that's inevitable and it's part of historical reflection. I think the, the critical thing that is important when we're engaging in commemorating the Civil War especially is to not judge, uh, to accept that those who uh, were engaged in making these decisions uh, did so for, with the best of motives, with the best of intentions, though they couldn't, nobody could foresee uh, what the outcome of what those uh, actions were. And perhaps more importantly, they had to deal with the consequences of their decisions and their actions. We don't. Um, and I think that's, that's uh, an issue that always has to be borne in mind uh, with regard to historical reflection. It applies especially to civil wars. Um, so one of my hopes is that the conduct of the commemoration of the civil war uh, won't mimic the civil war divisions themselves. Those civil war divisions are long gone. They have legacies, uh, which of course should not be ignored. Um, but we can treat the divisions that were evident and which, of course, manifested themselves violently and led to, to tragedies uh, for what they were, a piece of history uh, that is a cause of pride in perhaps the same way that the civil uh, the War of Independence was, but as part of, of Irish history. Um, and, and just to, to keep our uh, inevitable opinions, as it were, to the right and wrong, sort of in its proper place and, and perhaps just more properly just reflect that there but for the grace of God go all of us. So I, I guess my final comment about the Haleses, Tom and Sean and the larger family, Madge, Donal and all of them, um, is that it is what they have done on our part and for their country um, I am incredibly proud of um, and I'm quite humble at the feet of what they did really, considering what they sacrificed. But also too, especially in this year of centenaries and all the rest, um, it's actually bringing us our extended family, all the branches of, the, of those three offspring that had families. We come together quite regularly now to talk and speak about it and to share this history um, between ourselves and with the wider community, especially the historical community. Um, and I think it's kind of a bond that brings us together. Um, and the other thing is we're actively, by doing that, we're actively passing on this information to the next generation. For example, we, we brought the next generation to Sean Hales's um, graveyard there last Christmas. And we haven't done that before. Um, so we can't assume that they, you know, we, we actively bring them involved, but also with encouragement of, of, of that this is your heritage going forward um, and they're, they're developing that pride in it too.